sweet black night. Clouds shrouded the glaring moon and stars. Nothing spoiled the darkness. From the bushes across the street, he watched. The glass of the front security doors glowed in the beam of an overhead lamp. Through them, the lobby was lit like a showroom. A sofa, two chairs, a metal grid of mailboxes lining one wall. She always put her full return address on the envelopes. She'd moved twice since they sent Flip to Lancaster for a second strike. But he knew this address by heart, down to the number of her apartment. In his cell, surrounded by the clatter and noise of the other convicts, he'd stared at that return address, thought about her, what she'd be doing, what she'd look like. Six years. So long to be away from her. He had no choice but to move into the light. Its touch exposed him. His body hunched. His bones threatened to plunge through his skin. He tried the door. Locked. He squinted at the residence directory on the wall. His eyes went to the R's, but he didn't see her name. Out of the corner of his eye, Flip caught motion. Three kids, maybe twenty years old, moved through the lobby toward the door. One of them wore a plastic party hat striped red, white, and blue. Another carried a cellophane bag of what looked like party favors. The 4th of July. Flip had forgotten all about it. He angled his face away and entered random numbers into the keypad. The trio opened the door and cackled through. The door's hinge slowed its closing, and Flip caught it on its way back. The still air in the lobby carried the stench of ammonia. Twin panels of elevator doors stood on his right. He found the stairs instead. He climbed two flights and exited into the hallway. Number 304. He took a minute to breathe deep. Was his heart pounding because of the climb, or was it the excitement of seeing her again after so long? Could be she'd have a guy in there with her. She'd better not. The peephole in the door was a round animal eye staring at his face. He put his palm over it, rang the doorbell. Blood hammered in his temples. He rang again. No answer. He put his back to the door, insulted. Forget that she didn't even know he was out. Forget that he hadn't answered her letters for six months. The hallway was empty. He turned and palmed the doorknob. It wouldn't budge. Flip pulled a card out of his wallet and ran it between the door and the jam above the knob, feeling for the deadbolt. She'd set that as well. His foot shifted. He wanted to kick the door in, see the doorframe explode when the deadbolt crushed through it. But he didn't do it. He stuffed his hands into his pockets and returned to the stairs. Flip jammed a pebble into the latch in the front door so it wouldn't lock. Back on the sidewalk, he paced south, hating the streetlights that watched his steps. At the intersection, he turned around. On his fifth pass, a man's voice reached his ears. He saw them coming from the end of the block. The voice joked about something, and the speaker gestured with his hands. He glided along, self-assured, shoulders swaying, big mouth running. It was a walk and a talk that said the street belonged to him. Next to Big Mouth came Diane. She had a way of moving, erect on her high heels, that commanded attention. With the street light at her back, he saw her fine silhouette, the curves of her hips hugged by the skirt she wore and the blouse neat against her ribs. Flip stepped into the grass, outside the reach of the lights. Big Mouth kept drawing, cocky and unconscious of what was coming. Flip tried to block out the words to keep his impatient feet from running at him. Diane stopped. Her head shifted as she peered into the darkness where Flip waited poised with his hands at his sides, every muscle coiled, 